in Mumbanga we call a Dreamtime story Yuladara, a Yuladara. This story is about Dura, the bandicoot, and it's about the two eagle brothers that try to steal the fire off the bandicoot people. We had them 2019-20 wildfires that come through and devastated a lot of country. Devastated homes, devastated people, devastated the whole animal kingdom. Those last fires that went through were too hot and too fast. Nothing could have survived in that. It's a scary experience because the country hasn't been burning a lot of good shit for a long time. You don't really see some of them even coming back from after the intensity of the hot fires. The fires, will, if they're too hot, will actually destroy the whole tree. Rainforest species, stuff I've never seen. So they're all cooked, absolutely cooked. There's hardly no more animals left after the big fires, and that's pretty sad. When you go up in the mountains, don't see hardly any animals around. That's what I notice. We don't want them fires to come back through again. That fuel has to be reduced. We can minimise how wild that wildfire can be. Cultural fires is the way to go, yes. Better management of the forests themselves. The culture burn, that the animals will come back quicker. We do cool burning. Yeah, in the middle of winter when you need a bit of warmth, fires are going to creep along the ground slowly, you get moisture around. If we have enough cultural burn, these wildfires won't be happy. Fire well, is a very good tool if handled correctly. We're going to be doing some fire today, some wage. It's the right time of year. Yeah, it's still cooler months. It's the uh, beginning of August. We're looking to put some wage on the ground. To do that it takes a lot of preparation and also you know, consideration of the ancestors is very important to be able to listen to the country as you're applying fire. Yaring in the Warunga Jalikina Indi Ninda Giden Miralgo Bainia Jaroi Uyu Urugala Kumbangia Jugun. May we all acknowledge elder women, elder men, and our creator Yuladala in Gumbangir homeland. Ginagay New Jarwin, Nyayam Matthew, Nyayam Gumbangir Jambra. Hello, you Bob. My name's Matthew. I'm a Gumbangi man. So I'm the um, project's coordinator for Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council. That's the program's coordinator for cultural and heritage and, uh, and also the ranger teams. They look after pretty much everything that's within uh, Coffs Harbour and District Local Aboriginal Land Council boundary. We engage a Durundawaja ranger team, uh, which includes seven personnel, one team leader. They've got various skills on the ground with a range of land management activities which cover fire management, cover cultural heritage site management, implementing measures to protect cultural heritage sites, bush regeneration skills, weed management, riparian restoration and management, new plantations, at regenerating forests, also including monitoring activities. And we're going into pest management and trapping techniques as well to control invasive pests. We work on a range of land tenures, ranging from our, our own local Aboriginal owned lands, private land holders, national parks, New South Wales forestry lands, Crown land in general, and also riverways within fisheries DPI. Before conducting any burn, common practice for us at the Land Council is to engage our local elders, knowledge holders, to learn about the land first before even accessing at times. The knowledge holder or elder may advise to come along for initial inspection. Protocol number one should be acknowledgement that we've been here and we're still here. Um, And then everything else just stems from that, right? So we were here, what happened when we were here? Why would ridgelines and peaks of ridges be attractive to us? 
that protocol of not only communicating verbally from anyone's mouth, but we heard Kookaburra down there earlier communicating to us. Do we acknowledge and stop for a second and go, oh, you know, go gargum. And then do we appreciate what Kookaburra doing there with us? He don't need to be there, he could be anywhere, but he come there. These are protocols that our ancestors are telling us and talking to us. From that inspection survey, we'd be able to help inform our project further, provide the right cultural regimen, right cultural measures and um, practices and methods. It makes us feel good, and it makes us back in country that we're doing something for country. I believe it's a way of um, re-establishing respectful, healthy relationship with country again, where we're kind of coming in and, you know, trying to get country healthy again. It hasn't had the fortune of having that for quite some time now. The land, the land is everything, but there's nothing else in the world. So I have to look after this place. I have, I have a a duty of care in it. In it. We all do, as Aboriginal people, have like a duty of care to a landscape. Look after land, look after our animals, and look after our plants. It's been very beneficial to bring other Indigenous fire practitioners from all around Gumbangu country in to some of our larger burn projects. Uh, you know, we're talking about each leader of other fire practitioners that are out there, you know, provides 20 to 30 years experience per um, person they bring it out and it's a lot coming together. It's helping us to develop those resources across all of Gumbangia country when we're coming together. We're building each other's capacities up and we're able to bring that back home to our local patch, get more um, young people involved, build our fire practitioner teams up. So my job now is for me to take my younger assistants out, trainees. Now when I go out for surveys, and I can teach them how to identify artefacts and how to go about what they, what they have to do to, for protection and protection of themselves as well. How to respect the landscape, how to read the landscape, and pass on the knowledge that I have. It should be more rangers out there to be doing cultural burnings and looking after assets. And also it's not just about the older generation, being able to teach the younger generations. I reckon they'll hold their culture more firmly, being on country, knowing, knowing country and knowing their own culture. Let them have a wider opening on being able to look after their own country and also to get them more involved be able to talk to other people about country, be real good for them and they can teach their young little nieces and nephews about country too, yeah, and bring them on, yeah. Some of those other fire practitioners that we've worked with include Uncle Kenny Walker from Down Barrable. My father, he, yeah, he done a lot of business. He was a very good businessman language back to the Bumbangu Nation. I'm Reese Pacey from out Mr. Body Way. Um, I grew up in Daraville, hometown, um, yeah, mostly around here, but up, I've done, done cultural fire stuff up the top end. I got to work with Uncle Tommy George and Victor Stephenson. Uncle Philip Marsden from um, up Dorigo Way. My business is looking after land. It's called The Way It Was because I want to make it back to the way it was. I'm getting rid of weeds, doing cultural burns, just looking after land and country. That's his uh, main aim. Also Uncle Ian Brown, who's at uh, Coffs Harbour District Local Aboriginal Land Council. You've got to understand that Australia is actually built on fire. Fire, because that brings a whole new section of life. The plants were built on fire. Back when our ancestors would go, okay, the animals are moving this way or it's getting to winter, now's a good time to start burning. Fire, that element that's been missing for quite a while now. 
first European came to Australia, they were like, oh, there's fire, there's a wild fire, it needs to be stopped. You can't stop something that's happened for thousands and thousands of years. Well, we, it was only just our ancestors going, OK, now it's time to be able to do a burn. But because the European was there going, no more burning. We do cool burning, so we come in in the cooler parts of the year and do the burning at a particular time. When we light up the burn, it kind of is just trickling over the top layer of the ground and not really affecting that layer of the soil that holds all the nutrients. So it's like Mother Earth working with one another as well. The trees are working with the winds and the rain. Yeah. I think every Aboriginal loves fire burning. Yeah. <laughs> if we are fortunate enough to own land, we have a responsibility to care for that land, you know, to manage weeds, not use chemicals if we can avoid it. You know, the first year you've got mosaic burning that occurs and the second year you, you burn the areas that didn't burn the first year so you get a bit more full burn across the landscape over two years rather than one. That basically sums up one of the major differences between prescribed burning and cultural burning is that we're, we're not all looking to do it in one day. We've got a little bit more patience with our ecology out there and we want to get the best enhancement outcomes as we can. Do a bit more of this sort of stuff, you'll, you'll start seeing flowers, flowers, trees that, yeah, normally you haven't seen in a hundred years or so. That's the whole point about fire. It takes life and it creates life. This was all cleared 20 years ago. There was just a few big old trees in here, but it was all pasture. So a lot of weeds come back too as the bush regenerates, all these introduced species, predominantly lantana and privet in there. Because they haven't evolved with fire, they don't like burning, so it's a good way to help maintain the bush and get rid of weed species. Yeah! And then they go down there from there. Get a wet line in if you're worried. They just Yep, go. Go on, let's light it now. We also conduct like cultural burns in pastoral landscapes as well. Traditionally we, we had some open grassy woodland landscapes were pretty much the closest thing to our pastoral landscapes that we can see in the landscape today. Obviously in them grassy landscapes you've got a greater rate of spread with your fire. So your techniques change up, the ignition point strategy changes up a bit. We've just had a good amount of experience in both forest and pastoral lands because we know without managing pastoral lands it creates big fire hazards in itself as well. Having a cooler based burn using mosaic and cultural methods, point spot ignitions, you get a better forest enhancement effect without adversely impacting on the ecology where you're applying your fire. I'm just about at my youth fire date, there's not much more I can do but fighting for it. You know, so it's up to you young fellas now to actually step up and put the gloves on, you know. The other good thing about cultural burning on pastoral landscapes is that it can knock out a lot of those invasive weeds and more of a native shrubbing species can come up and outcompete the weeds that are undesired. We had some great results out here at Clang, burning the pastoral landscape which fire we was in, and we still haven't seen nowhere near the numbers what the fire we was like before come back. The right intensity fire can take out a bit of that blackberry as well. In the right conditions, we can plan for cultural fire to take out lantana. Lantana that isn't as dense is much easier to knock out than the high density lantana. It's not that it can't be done, but it may take a conventional treatment to work with the burning to get the desired result. Privet's another one. We just need the right intensity, the right conditions to be able to knock those weeds out. So there's a patch of molasses grass that I sprayed about five or six weeks ago. It was seeding. I collected all the seed heads off it and just wanted to not reseed until we could get a chance to burn it off. It sticks all over you. That's why it's called molasses grass. Very sticky resin on it. It's become 
quite a terrible weed to keep down at coastal areas. So I just want to get on top of it before it spreads. The burn itself may stimulate, in many cases, will stimulate the regrowth of natives to replace the basic weed. Immediately after fire, it makes um, conventional weed techniques a lot more easier to access. So yeah, you can navigate that landscape, um, get in, cut and paste, hand pull, um, fly chemical, do what you need to to um, knock those weeds out altogether from the landscape and um, yeah, get a good native response in return. How easy it was to pull the lantana out after a fire. Yeah. Even quite big ones that you'd never get out. Yep. Yeah. I don't like it. No. Before the fire, you can't even find the base to, to put the tree popper on or yeah. grab with your hand. You just can't get to it without cutting it back and spending so much time. Mm. That, that and all little snips it's, it's shooting all years impossible. It'll take forever. But this is like, yeah, you can see that it is possible to clean up this bushland using fire as a tool. Private landholders. One of the primary benefits is it uh, protects your home, protects your camp where you're living. So, yeah, it reduces that fire impact. They're going over there now, actually. To make another fire? Yeah, how quickly was that? It reduces uh, the fuel loading within your property, it reduces the hazard of that wildfire entering, and those routes of fire as well slows them down along those ridge lines if that fire is implemented. burning in and around the forest edge onto your pastoral land. If you look to regenerate that forest or expand on that forest, um, cultural fire is probably the best thing you can do to um, get that native seed to germinate. That will save the amount of plants you've got to propagate or buy because you've got that natural propagation occurring anyway with that wind blown seed drop into your pasture. And that's just waiting for the right opportunity to come up. And cultural fire gives it that germination, knocks that excess uh, grassy weed layer out, allow those um, saplings to get up. How's everyone going? Where are you at, Matt? Yeah, good. Uh, How's all lunch going over there? Good over here. Uh, good lunch. So last week we came in and put it this huge containment line in. A lot of effort, right down the ridge. Well, a lot of the old people used to implement fire on the old walking tracks which happened to be on a lot of the ridge lines in the Gulbangi country. And, and by burning in this high and dry location, creates a protective buffer zone and fire break to the lower rainforest and more fire sensitive communities, providing protective buffers to those sensitive environments. And you're also providing protective buffers to physical assets and cultural assets in the landscape. The regimen might include doing a protective buffer zone around a cultural site or around an ecological community where you, you know, put your higher burns in first at higher elevations, but when you get down in that community you might want to put a bit of a closer buffer zone burn in times where you've got forecast drought situations. So the old people knew how to read all that. They knew when a big drought was coming, they knew when a big rains were coming and so they used to prepare the ground well enough with fire as, as the main tool to protect from their impacts. You can't talk about the bush unless you live it. You know it. You know? It's part of you. you know? well, it's part of me anyway. I'll do my bit and add my spot fire while I'm there. There's the country. Thank you. Little cockroaches, little spiders. In a big wildfire, other fires, you actually can tell where the fire's been lit, the direction the fire's been lit. You can read that. Country will tell you that. Um, things will burn away and fall away. Yeah, just good to observe those things. Yeah. 
containment lines held beautifully. Had people watching all the time in case something jumps. Everything looks good. Can you stand down here with the black enough? Yeah, we don't have them in the house, we have one else. <laughs> Native plants have experienced fire over tens of thousands of years. Without fire, those fire dependent species um, are suffering. Providing that fire, that element that's been missing, we're able to fill that gap of what those fire dependent species need. You know, breaking down that forest debris into fast acting mineral deposits and uptake into native plant species, including seeds. So you're creating that rich and diverse soil condition that allows the seed to germinate. It also comes in the form of smoke. Where plants haven't been burnt in over 100, 200 years, they get that one sniff of flame, a bit of coal, a bit of smoke. It's like a fertilizer boom. That's what it is, smoke. And that's why a lot of hardwood trees come alive when they smell it, feel it, and just goes with it. As you look up in them trees, you can see they just loving that smoke. You should have a bit more fire practices. Without that smoke and without that mineral loading, the native seeds that have depended on fire, they'll continue to sit in that seed bank until they receive it. So they might be dormant for a long, long while until fire comes along. So that's the benefit of applying those traditional techniques again is that you don't necessarily have to plant out degraded landscape. Sometimes you just need to burn it appropriately and then you'll get a great forest recovery response in return. All our trees have adapted with fire, our landscapes evolved with fire and this is an evolution for fire. So all these little grooves, as the flames come up, you can see it here perfectly where the flames come up and have gone out. Why that's gone out? Because all these little grooves suffocate, take all the oxygen out and suffocate the flame. So it's a natural adaptation and all the insects will go up past those points, will run up, you know. Now that fire's been added, everything's signaled now. There's fire in the landscape. So the insects will know, the trees know, all the birds will know, and everything will start responding to that. So we'll start seeing all the little insects will start crawling out this way through and we'll start yeah, seeing them on the ground. Yeah. Yep. Start climbing higher. One of our laws is to never burn the canopy area of, of the forest. And that includes the mid-story as well. So you know the your foliage of your mid-story, if that's getting burnt, then you obviously your fire's too hot. Crowning is not what you want to occur. Reason wise, once you get a crown situation, your, your rate of spread increases because your intensity of that radiation increases within the fire. You've got atmospheric winds that come into the, the play as well, so as soon as it reaches that crown, your conditions change completely on the fire ground. So, if a wildfire was to come up through here, we'd be a lot better protected because. We've burnt a lot of the fuel on the ground and it's that fuel on the ground that generates the heat that causes the trees to crown and then the fire just leaps through the air, being pushed by the wind constantly at a rapid pace and then that's, you know, in those 2019 fires when so many people lost homes and, you know, so many animals were killed, they couldn't escape. Yeah. It was just moving so fast they couldn't escape, couldn't get down the tree in time, nowhere to go because it, they just enveloped. That 2019 fires, if they would have done more control burning across the whole state, we wouldn't have had the influx of fuel that most eucalyptus trees hold. But people don't understand that 
eucalyptus leaf might be sitting there for 20 years there's a lot of fight as soon as that gets cracked with a bit of flame that oil all that oil still in that leaf that's what the fuel comes from if you got any fire intense enough to burn the foliage of your mid-story or your canopy then you're taking away the forest defences it's actually not just a you know, upper defence but it's a lower defence as well because there's a defence in the actual seed bank or having a healthy seed bank reserve in, the wild, in a wildfire situation or a high intensity fire situation and it cooks that seed bank storage and it reduces the native seed stock you've got in that area it creates almost like a clean slate for any weed seeds to get blown in by the wind or deposited by birds and, and other species. Them kind of conditions are what led to the 2019-20 wildfires. It was um, that mismanaged ground shrubby layer in a great area of Gulbangia country um, and across the coast of Australia. Cultural fire's got the primary advantage of preventing wildfire and the way it does that is reduces the fuel layers within the ground layer, the elevated fuel layer, the shrub layer and the bark layer within the forest system without approaching the canopy. Cultural burning's got a natural thinning out process within the landscape. You probably have some excess juvenile saplings coming up in certain areas and fire, when implemented, properly not too hot but if you're doing it the right way you'll be able to knock out some of those excessive amounts of saplings so you get a increased growth rate by applying that cultural fire the balance is the key culturally that's really significant watching that circle that initial growth outwards because it's a circle of life it's that renewal it's that cleansing it's that whole um, you know, starting fresh out with the old into the new to promote that new growth give space for those animals to move into all those seeds will start falling back into that burnt ground ready to germinate cultural burning is done in the mosaic way we're allowing that fauna passage to remain got a culturally minded approach and ignition plan so that that fauna can escape the burn more than often you see the animals return and within a few days taken out the shrubby lantana and shrubby forest layer. So a koala, for example, is able to get to a tree and get up to safety when coming in contact with the predator species, such as a wild dog. So when it gets down here, it's a bit more moist. It just puts itself out. You can see how it's travelling downhill slowly. <laughs> so by applying a cultural burning techniques, the right people, the right methods and culturally informed in our practice, we're going to have a lot better results culturally, ecologically and um, to a physical asset management point of view in the long term as well. And our old people used to take advantage of that and use it as a farming tool. So they'll put a burn in here, put a burn in there, put several burns around the campsite within the hunting areas and they would know at what stage fauna would go to each burn area 
So they always knew where the hunt was, um, which wasn't much of a hunt because the animals would go directly to where they wanted them to go. So more like a you know fire stick farming kind of approach helped to cultivate the meat for the community as well to bring you know, good dinner in. So, yeah. <laughs> One of the most obvious signs after cultural burning is green regrowth that you get in the area. We've seen native vegetation considerably enhanced on all the landscapes that we've applied cultural fire. We've observed regrowth patterns over um, you know, immediately post burn, three months after burn and 12 months after burn particularly in the spoon that we've done out Colleen. Got great results out there. We've, within three months, we've seen the headstock on the kangaroo grass. I've noticed from the three month to the 12 month, by the time you get to 12 months after the burn, those seed heads are just thriving on, on the kangaroo grass. And you can tell why fire was used for both seed propagation to help generate that seed and food source, kangaroo grass and so on known flower maker among our other species and also to attract that kangaroo to come around and feed on it and allow for that cultural farming to take place. Just around where we've only had one mature grass tree propagating its seeds with the cultural burn we've been able to see another six or seven juveniles pop up after that burn implementation and that wouldn't have never happened without the cultural burn because there's just too much leaf litter there's 30 years of leaf litter there with that cultural burn to you know break through that leaf litter and create that desired mineral content in the soil layer we're able to germinate that seed for the grass tree and allow it to come up it's great to see that kind of impact on the ground yeah invasive weeds are managed quite well with fire and it's also given native vegetation the upper hand with canines for the wildlife we've had them actively involved doing koala scat surveys with their trained canine that's got the ability to um, sniff out scats a lot quicker than what our rangers can and we found some really good reoccurring results of a koala um, remaining within his, his habitat, within our burn locations. Um, th this is after two years of burning. We've had koala um, retain his um, presence there, which is great to see. It's proof that traditional cultural techniques uh, do support our native fauna. See here on the ground, so the fire's gone through here, ever so slightly just trickling down, but look, we haven't burnt everything, we've still got a mulch layer there. I threw a few of these sticks in some of the lantana and made a little burn pile here, but you can see how different it is when you do a burn pile on the ground yep. than next to it where we've had the natural slow burn, that it just does not leave any mulch under the ground. And it kind of scorches the ground, it probably cooks most seeds that are in there. With the right kind of fire, you're not making excessive amounts of ash. So you're not going to have the deoxygenation effects as what you would in a wildfire. And then wildfires, they cook massive amounts of logs and everything. You know, you'd probably at least expect 100 times more ash load than you would in a cultural fire situation. Because, um, yeah, we're not burning a, or a log habitat or a, or a hollow log, large dig stags and habitat trees. We're preserving all that and um, the only thing that's burned is the surface layer, surface fuel layer and elevated fuels that need burning don't drop much ash at all which include the grass species and shrubby species and leaf litter. You get a little bit of stick debris in there which carry a bit of ash but apart from that there's not much ash loading after a cultural fire. It is enough to stimulate the seeds though and that's the benefit of performing that cultural burn. People need more education they talk about us uneducated blackfellas, but we're more educated than what they realise, you yeah. know? But when it comes to managing the forests and, and, and land. National parks and forestry have got very large tenure to work with. So we've got resources to be able to get out there and, and do further work on ground. Like we've managed most of our own assets already with fire. We're looking for more land to work with.
we want to be able to enhance that ecology out in Gulmegi country and protect um, our cultural assets, enhance those vegetation communities so that habitats are thriving. Now, a wildfire can completely take out your timber stock if it hits it. You're going to be left with a whole bunch of charred out logs, an unworkable timber supply. So by managing it with cultural methods, you'll be able to preserve that timber supply. We've got advice for um, cultural harvest techniques, using mosaic methodologies in the landscape for harvesting also, because uh, it creates a you know, fauna passage, of course. You're not taking the whole block, you're taking mosaic sections each at a time. You're applying fire, so you've got an accelerated growth rate with the applied fire and that mosaic harvesting technique on the ground. You've always got timber there to harvest. Fire is what activated things like resins within trees that we use for tool making, your fruits and flowers that would germinate certain times and um, seeds that would propagate and create new um, forest supplies. Our old people used to harvest these forest supplies as well in a cultural way and those cultural resources would come back to benefit community. We believe that you know, traditional culture has got the answer for that to recover species from a critically endangered state. By providing fire, it's a traditional way of creating that diverse stock within your forest supply, so it's the best thing you can do for a forest. Well, there's so many benefits from it. Um, you know, the regeneration of the country, uh, getting rid of all that old dead or weedy undergrowth like the lantana, allowing animals to move through the ground again. and habitat trees and food trees and if you've got assets like fences or buildings or tanks or pumps or something you're protecting that in the event of a wildfire. First it was my biggest worry with private owners let us burn but they're the ones who are going ahead with it more than government, councils, fireys because all the knickknacks you've got to go through before you get a they pass is ridiculous, you know, where if they sit down and talk to traditional owners and that, that would rebound it quicker. And just to bring the, the wildlife back, um, the diversity of flora that's going to come back after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's not to like about doing it? Fire benefits the whole community. So you apply fire anywhere amongst the landscape, you're benefiting all people of that community. You're creating a fire break, you're encouraging regrowth, and you're working with your other community members as well. So to put a burn in, you need to talk to your neighbours. Just uh, talking to your neighbours is a great thing, and it's a learning experience for community as well every time you put fire in. Everybody's involved in this, not only us. Every, every person in Australia should be involved in this, you know, getting out cleaning the bush, you know. Different properties will burn in different ways, they require different regimens, and people can learn off each other, working together on your community fire projects. If a heavy fire season comes along, you know, you how to prepare for it. Yeah, you feel much safer as a result, and you, you just know how fire behaves, so you know when you got to go, when you can stay, and what you can do to prep for it. People doing the cultural burn, they have that knowledge to do it, a slow burn, to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. And it, yeah, it's just protecting you in the long run. I would encourage you, you know, any local landholders intending to use cultural methods to engage with your local Aboriginal land council to get the right advice. Turn it back into healthy bush. Use the resources that are in those areas traditionally. Then we might start getting some sort of repair done to Australia. No, it's not going to happen overnight, and it's not going to happen over a thousand months either. 200 years to stuff, and it's going to take more than 2,000 years to fix it. Uh, we've got to start somewhere, and it's got to be now. Keep 
hidden miracle. Yaring in the warung kejelikin na indi. Ninda hidden miracle. Hidden miracle. Hidden miracle. Hidden miracle. Yaring in the warung kejelikin na indi. Ninda hidden miracle. Ah, hidden miracle. Hidden miracle.